I want to welcome everyone that's here and thanks a lot um, that you're joining us, Claude, today. I'm uh, looking forward to seeing what you have to say about visuals and music. Um, and maybe you can start off by introducing yourself and then we'll go from there. Yeah, okay. So thank you, Melissa. Thank you for having me. So yeah, I mean, I'm Claude Eben, a Berlin-based uh, designer who's been working in the music industry now since 20 years. It's a long time, I feel. <laughs> um, I grew up in a small town at the northern seaside of Germany and I moved to Berlin in 1994. Um, I guess you can say that um, music and images, visuals, you know, was always something that interested me most since I was a teenager. So you would catch me, you know, listening to my favorite music while staring at the record cover. And I always felt that the packaging, the cover is an important part of the, of the spell that the music casts on you. Um, but it wasn't really uh, until I moved to Berlin and started to study here that I understood you can make a profession out of this. So in October 1999, I finished my communication study here. And my dream was always either to design book or record covers. And it just happened that I was at the right time, at the right place. And I got to meet the right people um, who would you know, pave my way on a personal and a professional level. So the year 1999 was the year it already began. Um, I started as a chief designer for Downwards Records, um, the UK techno label from the West Midlands, Birmingham, that defines industrial um, techno, you know, until these days. And from there, the journey moved from one thing to the next as Berlin at that time, you know, drew all the musicians into the city's melting pot, um, specifically techno and electronic music. Um, so I designed for uh, labels like Cancer Art Music, Trezor Records, um, several UK labels like uh, Blueprint Records, Counterbalance, Dynamic Tension, Sunway District, until these days also for Blaufield Music, Fuzz Records, Mord Records, and many more. So yeah, this is uh, where you pick me up right now. And um, I mean, yeah, so Melissa, you, you asked me to give an overview of how visuals uh, work in music and the importance. I actually want to ask you something before we get into the overview, because I'm interested in also, when you started um, talking about the past, you said you got inspired by um, the covers that you were seeing and thought, oh, you know, this is what I want to do. Can you give us a few examples of covers when you saw them? You were like, wow, OK, this is interesting. I'm inspired by this. Maybe like a few few records in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when I think some vivid ones, I think was, for example, David Bowie, Aladdin Sane. Um, I've been always a big Bowie fan. So this is the most obvious that comes immediately to my mind. And, you know, it was, it is an iconic cover, you know, and uh, it's, I don't know, it was colorful and nice. It was, uh, it was something different. I didn't quite know, you know, what's, that person on the cover and it well, went so well with the music, but I think it was also, um, let me think, I think like Grace Jones' Island Life, I mean, Grace Jones in itself is iconic, you know, and yeah. back then videos were also very big, so it always cooperated with the cover and the music videos and all the visual language that came from there. And, um, and Roxy Music, Flesh and Blood was one of my favorite covers. So I think I had a variation, you know, of, of covers where I was, I don't know, just drawn by it. And I think, I, I'm not quite sure what came first. Maybe it was also first the cover and then I was like, oh, I really want to listen to what's in there, you know? So because the cover was the first thing that you saw. So yeah. 
Uh, I'd be interested in talking about, um, is this still relevant in your opinion? Do people buy music by its cover or not, or has it changed? But maybe we come back to this after we talk about the overview of um, visuals and music. Yeah. Take it away, please. Yeah. So yeah, shall we move on and I talk a little bit about my inspirations? Yes, please. <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, you um, asked me to show maybe some examples of successful visuals. And when I think about successful music design, I think, you know, about inspiring, entertaining, um, eclectic, um, something that may be 30 years old, but could also be 100 years old or one year old. And yet, it can be something out of today or tomorrow even. And I think for me, one great example when it comes to that kind of design is Peter Seville and his works for Factory. Um, I think we talk about the years, something between 1978 to 1985. And Seville began a, a designing uh, factory graphics, including posters to promote events which have, for example, like a simple yellow background, black stripes design um, taken from these caution barrier tapes to restricted areas and a stylized um, factory pictogram imagery. You know, uh, I, I can show you what I mean because I've got um, those. Yes, please. All right. Ooh. So idea of, you know, and that was back in those days, this is nothing from today but I think it's, it's, it's powerful. And um, yeah, so it was so simple and iconic that you could hang it up anywhere now and think it's an event for next month. And Factory Club Nights then turned into a music label with bands like Joy Division, Dindisk, A Certain Ratio, and New Order. And Peter Settle designed the record covers, you know, how only he would design them and how only Factory Records would look then. And I think, the one uh, I think a lot of people know, which is very familiar, is the Joy Division cover of Unknown Pleasure from 1979. I can show you that too. Um, it's that black cover uh, with those white waveforms. And, you know, with such a cover, um, you know, how could the music not be important and new back then? And it was secretive, it was symbolic, um, it was visual sound. Uh, Aesthetic movements, a tuned time, and I, you know, which probably helped to create a reality where you could perceive the band as truly great. Um, or there was um, the first record uh, from Factory in 1978. Um, it was a Factory sample. Uh, which was very cool, actually, and was based on the Factory poster design, and it's this um, silver uh, paper. Oh, I hadn't seen this one before. It's really cool. Yeah, it's really cool. And it's put into plastic, folded and sealed and cut out. Yeah. Times 5,000. <laughs> and Tony Wilson, the, um, the, uh, the founder of Factory, the label founder said about it that, you know, that this release was basically form over content. And, mm -hmm. And making the sleeve was like, had something to do with this miraculous thing of actually creating this product and a record. And, you know, being part of that, you know, the process and, you know, that it was something wonderful and something sacred. And to be honest, like, I think that pretty much says it all about record cover design, because for me as a consumer and music lover, I find it just, you know, as wonderful and sacred now to have it in my hand while playing the record. And it's despite any digital times we're living in, yeah. or maybe even more so because of that, you know. And, um, and another name that comes to my mind too is Vaughan Oliver. He was art director for 4AD. He was designing cover artworks for the Pixies, Cocktail Twins, That Can Dance, um, and this mortal coil, the breeders, and as that goes also back to 1980, where it started. But I find his whole 
archive of work um, incredibly unique and inspiring. And Foydi had a more maybe mysterious abstract approach, very much working with photographs as well. And the Cocteau Twins covers, for example, capture the music uh, brilliantly with very atmospheric, emotional visual approach, you know, which felt like as if you could just dive into that artwork, like you could dive into the music and get lost. So I think, to be honest, you only would have to Google now Peter Savile Factory or Vaughan Oliver 4D. And under images, you get an immediate visual mood board of what I think shows two examples of really brilliant visual worlds in the music industry. And what I personally really loved about that music design legacy um, is that it didn't seem to follow any design guidelines or formulas, you know, like the artist and tiles should be on top. So when you flick through the records in the store, you can see that first. Or the Joy Division cover, for example, doesn't even have the title and artist on the front at all. Or that it has to be sent size to be readable or whatever rules you can come up with. Um, different music different artists require different visual languages. And, you know, it's when you break the rules that it really comes alive and becomes art in a way. So I found that incredibly inspiring and encouraging for my work. And this is basically how I wanted to create artwork too. So, yeah. Um, we've talked about a lot of qualities of these timeless covers yeah. and um, as far as I understand the only thing they have in common that they break some sort of rule or expectation of uh, what should happen. Does that, is this something you agree or am I jumping to conclusions? No, what do you think, think makes a timeless cover? But can we have you know a couple of guidelines or is it just always depending on whatever the music is or whatever the, the time, well, not the time, of course, if we're talking about timelessness, but yeah, what um, makes a timeless cover? I'm not really good with guidelines, to be honest. And I hate guidelines myself. Um, it's good to know them, so, you know, that you can break them when you want to do that on purpose, but, um, well, to, timeless and to, to, to surprise people. I mean, I guess back in the days when you look at Peter Seville's designs, that obviously maybe was much more easier than today. We've seen it all. It doesn't feel like as if you can reinvent the wheel, you know? So I think maybe back then, I don't know where they drew their inspiration from. I see some parts of Bauhaus design in it. So, you know, some kind of history, probably also all, old art, um, but obviously we have seen it all now, but still I think when design cooperates with the music, that's, that's when it can become, become timeless without following any guidelines. Just do what you think feels best for the music. And when you create that together with the artist who does the music, I do think that it can be timeless no matter what. And uh, talking about this, what is your process then? Do you listen to the music on repeat while you are designing or how does it work for you? How do you connect best with, with what you're doing? Um, well, I, I'd say, yeah, it, it's, it's an emotional connection, but for me, um, usually do not listen to the music first. I meet the artist or I know the artist already. And I first, you know, get what, I don't know what, what they tell me, you know, I, I first have a conversation with them and, you know, listen to the artist's story, the inspiration behind it. I see very clearly who sits in front of me, you know, who, what drives them, what's their creative heritage, how do they perceive themselves, how do they want to be perceived, um, what pushed them to where they are in that moment, and I kind of collect all that information, and that usually sometimes it can be word, it can be vibe, 
that you know you have certain visuals that come up in your mind. I mean, I I think visually. Um, so yeah, yeah. You 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 say a word, or you have, or someone even gives me a reference of a cover or music he listens to, or what he loves, and I kind of get them where you're coming from. You know what made you, you know, being this artist, and. Then I get the music and then we kind of take it from there. And uh, I'm, I'm lucky. I usually had the freedom to, first of all, just do whatever I wanted to do, you know, with the information I got, obviously. So, but it, I think it's, a, it's an intuition. You know, I'm not much of a conception person. It's intuition and emotions. I, I agree with that, that flow with going with your intuition. I think that's a wonderful way to make art. Um, um, you were talking about the, the overview. I remember, do you, do you want to share your screen? Should we go on there or? Uh... Yes, let's do that. Then we can, uh, wait, get into, because I've prepared some work. While Claude um, prepares her screen sharing, we can. Um, I, I'd like to um, say a reminder to our participants: if you have any questions at any point, please write them in the chat. And once it's time for the Q and A, we will also give you uh, permission to switch on your video so you can um, ask in person. So, can you see this? All right, or. Melissa, can you see okay, cool. A moment, no, I'm waiting for it to load, but it's 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 dark. It's the black screen at the moment. All right, okay. I made it a full screen. Shall I maybe not do that? You have to give some sort of permission. Yeah, All right, we have it now. Have it? Yes, great. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> Hi, Alexander, by the way, welcome. <laughs> I got the technical world. Um, we, we had it for a moment, Claude, but then um, we didn't anymore. What did you change in between? Okay, yeah. now it's there. All right, so it's the full screen mode that caused the problem. Okay, good. Okay, cool. So we got this. Right. Um, yeah, when I, I think to, to get a good overview is like when I start with work from Downwards Record, because they were the first label I worked as a chief designer for. And um, yeah, so I'd say that um, Downwards, how do I put this, is, um, was inspired or like the back background of it is um, industrial punk, roughness, um, darkness, because their musical roots was pretty much, you know, crowd rock just as much as bands like Throbbing Gristle, who were um, basically the inventors, inventors of so-called industrial music genre. And which was again then a crucial, um, part of the development of techno culture. And, you know, I think very often what we had then was like a collage of a lot of things that tried to capture it all. So for example, with this first artwork, you know, you have something that looks a little bit like blood stains. You've got like this dead pigeon in the background. It's got a bit of this modern world brutalism. And um, the next ones, we had some seven inches design. And, you know, just to give you an idea of what we were thinking, you know, you have obviously this negative photo of a woman sitting on a toilet. And I think it was always the drive that, you know, we did, created something and it was this, does this look like a record cover? So no, it doesn't. So that was, pretty perfect and then we just went for it because you know we liked to play around with stuff that challenged it was maybe a little bit disturbing maybe a little, little bit you know just 
off and may you be curious of what the actual sound would be. When you listen to it, then the whole picture basically makes sense. And yes, so that's pretty much how we kept it with um, many of the designs. And I think, oh yeah, I, mean, I think one point of what besides the musical, uh, musical inspirations I had, what I mentioned before was Bauhaus and their designs, the theaters, the products. I think it was one of the movements that influences a lot of people. Maybe it was the crucial movement that a lot of people do quote. You know, I can see that in so many designs or cover artworks. And um, obviously we had that as well. So because art, photographs, architecture, you know, that's all kind of parts where you, you know, get your ideas from and your inspiration for your work. Yep. And, oh yeah, this one was, actually reminds me a little bit of the factory sample I just showed you. Mm -hmm. um, we did that in 2011. This was a compilation of works of the artist Regis on downwards. Um, so covered the years from 1994 to 2001, and we worked with a local bookbinder. Um, so we had this gray linen uh, book with the engraved title, and we hand packed it basically 300 times into that envelope. And um, it contained this poster, you know, a photo flyer and uh, yeah. Did I say postcard? Poster. Poster. <laughs> that was right. Lots of collages so far. Are these digitally made or handmade collages? Um, no, uh, these are all digitally made. I mean, mm -hmm. I could slap my hand sometimes. I wish I would do it handmade, but you know, we have all the tools these days. And I do love collage. I work a lot in Photoshop and Illustrator. And um, I still, you know, get my ideas and inspirations or images. We either do the photographs ourselves or whatever. We collect old images uh, from somewhere, from old books uh, or whatever, and then just get ideas from there and try to find locations where we get similar pictures. Um, so it's always very much we do our own pictures and then work from, from Photoshop and do the collages ourselves. Well, I do. So yeah, that was the most recent one from the um, Downwards label. I think that gives you a good picture of the visual look of the label. And that is a uh, surgeon and it's also techno music, um, very abstract. And, you know, I always love to play around to have a little bit rough. Um, the only one that stands out a little bit because I usually really don't have artists on the cover. Um, so that was actually an exception because Tony surgeon, he gave me this portrait uh, picture and he had a clear idea of I would like to have a Bowie quote. So, um, you yeah, know, yes, it is a clear nod to um, David Bowie's Changes LP, uh, which was easy for me because I'm a big Bowie fan. So we had that obvious hint. And I think it was just a little bit to suggest a bit of a shape lifting in, um, in skin to a sound while essentially, you know, it's, it's uh, the engines to it effectively remained the same. Uh, oops, sorry. So that was, uh, next one is Blueprint Records. It's also a UK label, the fear ratio design. Um, the next one is a compilation on that label in 2016, they had a 20 years uh, um, release, which was a little bit of a, Blueprint design manifest we created. So it was a vinyl sleeve. And inside we had the poster with the front and the back design. And sorry to interrupt, but I just want to know about something. Now that we don't have that many physical copies of albums, album art has 
had to, um, well, it's cut in half basically because we don't have enough space to, to have this art. And also many ar uh, artists don't release print, um, um, don't release physically anymore. Um, how do you think this has changed now that we're also talking about, um, yeah, that this in more detail? You mean the importance of the cover design or? Well, also that, I guess it's a bigger view um, question. Now that there's less space to occupy in album design, how has that um, impacted the design of covers themselves, the digital, di digital covers? Um, for me, funny enough, personally, for me, when I work on covers, it really hasn't changed much because I still think that it's, uh, if, it's, if you have a record sleeve, a full record sleeve, or if you have a tiny digital cover in Spotify when you flick through, um, you know, it either is great or is not. I do think if it works in big, it works in small. That's pretty much how I see it. Because when we, even when we still do physical um, releases and we create vinyl first, like obviously everything comes out digitally too and it does work and it's there the same thing that you don't have to follow there any guidelines either why should the cover then you know contain the artist's name and the title it says it underneath in when you have it digitally you know you also might just have a beautiful cover artwork with no information on it because the information will be somewhere online yeah. you know yeah. Or is it in Spotify? You always have the artist title and the track title somewhere anyway. Um, but I still do think, I was actually thinking about this the other day um, because I was listening uh, to a playlist I share with a friend and we usually kick in music there. We don't know sometimes and surprise each other. So it's a really fun way of getting to know different music. And while having it on my phone and flicking through the tracks, I was still, maybe that's me because I'm a very visual person, but I still thought how brilliant that was that I had all these different cover artworks and they all kind of played with the music and they all had an impact, you know? And sometimes, yes, you still do that, see that first before you listen to the music and it can, look great and inspire you or you listen, you see the cover and think, oh, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, uh, I want to come back to that and ask you about instances in the either, um, yeah, both sides. But I see that we have a question from James. I'm not sure if James want to, wants to ask this question in video or not, um, uh, but uh, yeah, let's give him access and if he wants to he will i will start reading the question if that's fine with you claude yeah sure um james says hi claude you spoke about the way you approach your collaborations with musicians what about the other way around what advice would you have for musicians from their end to approach working with visual artists what makes for a good collaborative dynamic oh wow that's a good one um if you can give the designer um, the most information possible. You know, I, when, when I work with artists and they're maybe not that clear about what they like, I like to maybe um, get a mood board of stuff they love or, um, you know, really just like tell the designer what inspired you. Maybe what's the music that made you do the sound you're doing, uh, what, what is your emotional background behind it? And then also, yes, cover artworks you do love, something where you see yourself, where you could imagine your cover being there. You know, very much what I said, like, tell them how you perceive yourself and maybe think about really how do you want to be perceived? You know, yeah. it is all about image and it's about something, you do create something up front that has to, is a package to your music and it has to show the world, you know, who you are, or who you want to be and what the music stands for. And the more you can give out information, the better I think it is for the designer to capture it. 
you know? All right. So as much detail as possible, even if it seems irrelevant. I think, yeah, yeah. actually, right. I, I think so. If I get information from people, it's not like I don't take everything into my work, but the, the more you can give me, especially when you have not worked together before, when you've been working together for a long time, then you know. Then it sometimes really just needs a word or, you know, or just a picture you give the designer and the designer knows what to do with it. But that's a lot of trust and, you know, uh, maybe a few years working together or a few projects at least. But if it's the very first time, then yeah, give out as much information as possible. Don't be shy with it. You know, I think so, my, as a designer, you still deliver service. All right, thank you for the answer. I think James also has a follow-up question, but I don't know if he wants to ask it himself. I think we, he, yeah, you should be able to ask. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes, all good, we could hear you. I can at least. Okay, great. Um, yeah, my question was a uh, follow-up actually to the uh, question of uh, the topic that you were speaking about, about the shift from physical to to digital and how that's kind of changed um, uh, or shifted some of, of the work. And I find that an interesting topic. Um, uh, and so my question was, uh, you know, how has the shift towards digital releases and all of the ways in which that changes um, the concept of art changed the way in which, or, or not, changed the way in which you work, uh, theoretically, uh, you know, it could be more than just a, you know, 12 inch by 12 inch um, uh, physical uh, album cover, but also something like an animation or a video or a whole visual gallery or website to accompany a digital release, um, sort of the sky is the limit, so to speak. And I wanted to know if you had any, any thoughts about the like limitlessness that online spaces provide uh, versus the limitedness that physical spaces and resources provide and how that may have changed or not the way in which you approach your work? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm not quite sure if physical really is that limited either. I mean, even there, you do a CD, you can make a booklet with 20 pages if you want to. You know, you could have always, if you wanted to go crazy and, uh, you know, create packages like with like what we saw before, you can make a book or this and that. So yes, I mean, I guess you just have to have uh, the digital world in mind and you know how obviously it will work in the surrounding, that's different. So you don't think record store, you think obviously, you know, social media, Instagram, how it would stand out. But I still think that um, the limitless of that is, is you know, it's great. If you want to use it, you use it. Um, I have many artists who actually really don't use it that much because you also don't have to waste too much energy to, to it, you know? I think sometimes less is more. But the visuals that, you know, obviously for live gigs as well, I mean, that was, if it's digital or not, always something we took maybe in connection with the cover artwork, you know? All right. Um, I am sorry to interrupt this conversation. And maybe after um, this, this session, uh, when everything is, um, well, when Alex has done his presentation, we can come back to these questions and discuss them in further detail. Um, our time is up, um, Claude. It was really great. It just flew by. Thanks a lot. Um, and yeah, if you hang around, we might also chat after Alex's presentation. I don't know if you have time, but I'm sure James would appreciate hearing more of these answers. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so thank you, Claude. Um, our next presenter is, our next speaker is Alexander Wodrich from Why Do Birds? And he'll be talking about sonic branding and I'll give the floor to Alex or Alexander. Yes. Hello, I can see a nice screen from you there. <laughs> um, 
Hello, um, yeah, I'm Alex, and I'm. Uh, thank you for having invited me to this uh, most wanted music session. And um, indeed, uh, I work in at, at an agency, or I founded the agency Why Do Birds in Berlin, which is all about audio branding. And um, when we discussed this topic that we are talking about today, um, about musicians, and we were talking about record covers and the design, and I knew that Claude was going to be here, I thought maybe it's not so interesting to show you the studio work of what we do, but rather to stay a little closer to the artist and uh, connect closer to how artists do branding. And um, I, I think that record covers are a perfect, perfect way of creating a brand like this. Um, but hold on, I'm gonna share a screen now. I'll try to share the screen, let's see if that works. Beatles have a lot of wonderful covers, but the one you choose chose for your background is one of my favorites. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That we see um, Klaus Forman's uh, artwork for the Revolver cover in 1966 from the Beatles, and um, Klaus Forman was actually a guy from Hamburg who the Beatles met before they became famous when they were playing in Hamburg, and yeah. Klaus Forman. Uh, then started to learn to play the bass, and he did. He was an, an, a visual artist, and in his later on in his career, he played the bass for John Lennon on the solo records. He's and, the uh, unofficial fifth Beatle, I've heard, right? Yeah, well, he's. Um, I, I think he's probably the sixth or seventh Beatle, because the fifth Beatle would be their producer, George Martin. But um, <laughs> but he's definitely one of the close Beatle family. <laughs> And um, okay, but hold on, I'm going to share a screen now here. Does anybody see my screen with a lot of stuff on it? Oh, yeah, it says brands. Can you see brands? Yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you see brands? We do, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, then, um, yeah, so, but I want, since I want to stick with artists, I'm not going to talk very much about, you know, classical brands. You know, it's, uh, if you look here, name these brands, name these plants. Um, we, we today's world we are so much more uh, attached obviously to brands and we, we know them but nobody here can name these plants anymore or the, the, the kind of trees where these uh, leaves come from so we're sort of like uh, more into this marketing world we're absorbed by media and if you look at this this is how brands you know, communicate their brand. This is their corporate design. Um, and I'm sure most of you will recognize these brands, even though they don't have their name on them. These are not the classical logos, but it's an old way of showing how visuals work. And I don't know if you've guessed them all. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'll just tell you what it is. Maybe you can tell what Coca-Cola is. You can see the magenta color of Telecom. So maybe sometimes just one color is enough to give away the brand. And then something like a key visual from O2 with the bubbles from the telecommunication mobile. And maybe a little tricky on the bottom where it says brand. It's actually more about the typography typeface and that is, um, does any, I don't know, nobody's talking in this call anyways, but otherwise <laughs> if we were in a real conference, everybody would shout and say, oh, I can recognize Nivea here. <laughs> So these are how, 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 how it's communicated. Um, and of course, um, when, you come, when it comes to like record covers and artists, they, um, they also have logos. And I think a, a, record, art, um, a record sleeve designer will also ask, um, do you guys already have a logo that should be put on the sleeve? Because if you do, and you're gonna use that for, I don't know, there's a lot of band, the Beatles, for example, their logo, uh, hasn't really hadn't really changed. It was used over and over again. And so uh, I had a look at a very popular artist, which was Billie Eilish, and I was very surprised. Um, although she's only been around for, I don't know, two, two years, it's only released one album. There's already so many different typefaces out, which is not very common in branding, but maybe that also means that there's something happening, there's a shift happening in in this classical corporate design and logo design. Things are getting more fluid, things are changing more quickly and nobody really bothers like in, with, with keeping something constant anymore in, in popular music. 
or maybe an artist like Billie Eilish, because the name is already so big, she doesn't have to, she can do whatever she wants. Some artists probably do well in sticking with one very clear idea of a logo or a design or an image just to get known. But I guess once you've made it, you sometimes have a little more freedom. And I brought some examples of artists um, that really didn't have that much freedom in their career. So um, let's see if you recognize some of these artist brands, we, I call them. Does anybody know this band? Because as you can maybe see from, uh, you saw me before, then you know that I'm not 25 anymore. <clears throat> um, but when I was a little boy, these, this, these guys were popular. Um, that was uh, when I was really small. But one of the first bands that I heard was YMCA. Yes. And these guys, I am very, very certain, did not meet somewhere or at school or were friends wearing these clothes. <clears throat> the, <laughs> this was a, a decision made to say, okay, we need an image. And somebody decided, probably the record company or management said, okay. I would have loved to be at that meeting where this was decided. That was a fun meeting for sure. That was a fun meeting for the management, not so much for the guys playing in the band, probably, <clears throat> because somebody says, okay, you're the Indian. That means every day, every time that this band was appearing anywhere, this guy had to put on his Indian costume. The other guy was the policeman. The other guy was the cowboy and so on. <clears throat> and so this is obviously something um, that can be fun for a few months, but if you're stuck with that for a longer time, Thing that can be very tiring and very, very, very strange. But you know, if, if you're 10 years old or five years old and you see something like that, you say, hey, these guys are having a lot of fun and you just don't ask yourself what's going on in their heads or was there a plan behind this? <clears throat> but it was, they, these guys created a very, very strong image. And I think a lot of the, the big, one of the big reasons why they were very popular is because they wore these outfits and they were gladly invited to TV shows. They were gladly invited to play live at any event because, of, hey, if you get YMCA on the stage, there's gonna be a lot of fun and people will love seeing this. Another band that had a similar approach, oh, not really similar approach, but if you remember Bonnie M, <clears throat> um, this is actually quite, actually terrible if you look at it from uh, today's perspective on, you know, discrimination and, and, and cliches of black, people in chains, and this is actually disgusting. But um, this, this band wasn't really a band. They were also collected in the 70s by some record producers and um, they were they did not choose to do this or have this outfit or to be created. This band. None of these people knew each other before. Um, Michael Jackson is a big brand musically. And this guy, um, Although he didn't need to do that. And he, this, I mean, he, after having put out Thriller, he could have done whatever he wanted. He could have changed his style and his look and anything. I mean, he tried to change his look by getting oh, yeah. wider. Was... <laughs> but not as, not as far as his image went. I mean, musically, he would say, oh, that's my style. That's what I'll do. And I remember that he was wearing a white glove most of the time and he was still doing the moonwalk dance because it was expected of him. So he was also stuck in an image and I'm sure if he wanted to change it, there would have been managers say, oh, no, 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 no. Don't you change a thing. This is why you're really big and why you're famous. Don't do anything else. Don't try hip hop. <laughs> Stay with the kind of music that you do. Um, there's a German guy called Udo Lindenberg. I mean, this guy's been around for 50 years or so and known for his hat. And he's, uh, I think he's wearing the hat, not because it's his style, because he doesn't have any hair on his head anymore. Maybe that's the reason. <clears throat> but that's a very, very clear style. Um, oh, yeah, I love this example of Kiss. Yes. Um, these guys, I mean, actually, they, they played as Kiss when they started, they didn't have any masks. I don't know who came up with that idea. I don't even think it was the management. It might, could have even been them or, or somebody. And, um, but 
that gave them such a boost. And although the music is fairly mediocre that they put out, uh, it's probably a lot of fun to see these guys perform live on stage. But what a hell of a hassle it, this is for these guys to wear these masks and have all these all this makeup. And um, at the end of the day, I mean, if they walk around on the street and they're not wearing that mask, nobody's going to recognize them, which can be nice on the one hand side that you can keep your freedom. But on the other hand, it's probably terrible for them because they say, hey, I'm the biggest rock star for 90 minutes. And then as soon as I'm off stage and wipe the makeup off my face, nobody knows me. I'm just this very, very regular guy nobody wants to talk to. And uh, if I tell them, hey, I'm the lead singer in Kiss, nobody's going to believe me. And I'm not such a great dude after all. So all that's, you know, um, things to consider in a career. What do you want? You know, if you want to be, you can be authentic and be yourself. And uh, that's what I guess a lot of people do. And but if you want to like do a big style, be with a major label, and be a millionaire, then there's some compromises you have to make. Find a really distinct image and do that. <clears throat> this guy Helge Schneider, German uh, comedian. Well, I mean, he doesn't see himself as a comedian. He sees himself as a jazz artist. He's an amazing <laughs> jazz musician. And but the thing is, because he wasn't very successful in his youth, he was telling more and more stories on stage between his jazz music songs. And uh, at some point, he just realized that people are coming to his show. They accept him playing the music, but actually, they want to hear the stories between the songs. And um, so that's why he just realized he has to tell these stories. And yes, I don't know, he's wearing he's wearing. Uh, a funny wig and funny sunglasses and doing strange moves on stage. This guy often got tired of doing that. I remember after his big, big breakthrough with top 10 hit single, um, he decided not to be funny anymore, not to tell any more stories. And he changed his band. He got a band name called Helga and the Firefuckers. I don't know if anybody recalls that. And uh, he was just playing rock music. And people thought, oh, it's going to be a fun concert, Helga Schneider playing rock music and telling funny stories. But he wasn't telling any stories, so nobody showed up for the shows anymore. And then he said, OK, I guess I have to go back to being funny again, play my role, because that's what's expected. Um, so it's always, you know, I have to see what do people find authentic in you? What do people see in you as an image? Why do people come to a show? <clears throat> Oh my God, this guy is called Crow. Um, I don't know, I thought, why? Why does he need that mask? Is he so ugly? But it really, really worked well. And this guy as well called Zido has also worn, worn a mask for a number of years. And at some point he just said, I can't handle it anymore. And that was a very, very brave move. And he said, he's gonna remove this mask and see how's it gonna work. He turned from being a, I don't know, more or less respected hip hop rap star into going really, really mainstream then. And it worked for him. And he doesn't have to wear the mask anymore. I think he's pretty happy about that, that he's still uh, still out there. And somebody else who took off their masks were these guys. <clears throat> Anybody recognize them? Those were Kiss from what I showed you before. Um, I recognize the tongue. That was the key. exactly. That's probably about it. And after a number of years, actually not that many years, I mean, they were really, really big. They play all the big stadiums in the seventies and early eighties. And then they said, "No, we're just a great, amazing band. We don't have to wear this anymore." So they took off their makeup, said we're unmasked, and nobody came to the shows anymore. And uh, they really went really went downhill from that moment on. And for about 15 years, nobody wanted to see them anymore. And then they had this big comeback because they wore the mask, put on the make makeup again. And for the last 10 or 15 years, they've been on touring the world again with masks, and which is also good because nobody can see how old they are now. And, um, <clears throat> but now they're getting, uh, getting fun out of it because they, they've come to a certain point in their life where they, they don't have to prove anything anymore you know if you're like then 60 years old say hey, let's go out there enjoy it, play rock and roll and people will love it and let's have some fireworks on stage so um that's basically i thought quite an interesting view on on on, on how images can be created and these guys that take that 
And on the left hand side, you can see Robbie Williams at young age. And uh, these guys were casted as a band and everybody got their role. You're the funny one, you're the thoughtful one, and you're the melancholy guy and uh, whatever. <clears throat> and they had to play these roles. And obviously if you're very young and, and, and somebody promises you fame and I don't know, traveling the world and driving limousines and living in big hotels and having lots of fans, then you think that's a great idea. And, but I think the effect wears out after like one or two years and you just say, what have I done to myself and my life? People like me for something that I'm pretending to be, which I'm not. So the same was, these are the Spice Girls, the first casted girl group, um, uh, mid nineties. And they all got names uh, on the left. It's Miss Beckham is the posh one. Then the one beside her um, with the curly black hair, she's a scary spice. And Baby on the right spice. hand side, the we sporty spice. We the friend the other day, Baby Spice, Ginger Spice, Sporty Spice. I'm up to date on this now. <laughs> very, very good. <clears throat> yeah, so they had to play roles and that's also how the outfits were chosen to, so that, uh, you know, there's teenage girls out there that that's for everybody, there's somebody to identify with and say, oh, look at them, they're all friends and they're all different and so on and so on. So strong message, girl power. And um, it's obviously, as I just said, these bands have to break up after a while because you can't carry on like that forever. And so if uh, some artists that stay true, oh, actually though, there's another one. This is Millie Vanilli. <clears throat> Anybody remember the story of Millie Vanilli? That was around in the early nineties, I think. Um, these guys were, also casted to play at, in uh, to, to be a, a duo band and the producer said you guys look amazing and you guys can dance really well but you don't sing very well let's just why don't you just mouth the words and uh, somebody else will sing and so they got famous and they didn't even sing and um it was their decision at one point in the career after about a year and a half that they said they thought they were so great and nothing could hurt them because they had, I don't know, screaming fans everywhere said, we want to sing ourselves. And the guys in the studio said, no way. And they said, yes, we will. And so they did. And uh, the, the big scandal was that they couldn't sing and uh, nobody wanted to hear them anymore. They had to return their Grammys and so on. But um, so it's, it's, it's all a big game in the music business out there. <clears throat> Fans, oh yeah, this is that's actually the reason why these things happen. Fans, these, okay, we can see these fans must like crow. Um, they wanna identify with somebody and they found a common thing. These guys really wanna be, I don't know, have something in common. For example, who, what kind of fans are these guys? These guys, are Oasis fans. These guys are going to concert of, anybody remember the name? <laughs> well, there could be many, no? No. Can Manson. Only... Marilyn Manson. Yeah. It's yeah. Marilyn Manson concert they're going to. And, and you know, Anyways. this is actually, it. you know, if, 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 if you find an artist that you love and you can identify with, and you don't want that artist to change ever. And um, which I know there's uh, exceptions, especially since Claude was mentioning people like David Bowie, because they were so authentic. That was his image was to keep on changing. That's because he could. <clears throat> These guys are going obviously to a Sex Pistols concert. And um, it, it, it's something that unites them. It's something that you know gives you uh, some sort of belonging to find uh, friends who share the same ideals, to, to share the same ideas, and who who like the kind of music and the style and, and all relate to something. That's how music works, because music is made to make, make for something you want to connect with. That's why, I don't know, as a teenager, I was look, looking at artwork of record covers for hours and hours. I was just looking at the record cover and 
flipping it back and forth. And boy, was I happy when there was a, a sleeve inside with a picture on and lyrics inside. That was the most amazing thing. And I could spend hours on that. I knew every word that was written there and I saw every spelling mistake there was and um, I loved every millimeter of that. And that, that's, that's what turned me into somebody said, oh, and I you know, checked out the fashion. What, the, what are these guys wearing? And what are their hairstyles? And you take the record cover along to the hair, hairdresser and say, can I have the haircut of this guy? And they said, unfortunately, you can't. You don't have that hair. <laughs> you go, damn. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's what you're thinking. Oh, yeah, these girls are going to Shakira concert. Yes. <clears throat> and well... This is, I don't know, Bob Dylan fans. And, but this is real, you know, they were like, these photos were really taken from people going to these concerts. <laughs> oh, that's great. Not really staged. So um, that's it. People want to identify with something. That's what an image is all about. Create an image, stick, uh, you've got to stick to it somehow to have a certain image. And of course, people want to connect with that. Oops, is there anything else? Oh, because consistency. Yeah, well, okay. Here's an example of the Rolling Stones. They've been doing what they're doing for 50 and some years already. And which is very authentic because I don't think they can do much else than be the Rolling Stones, which is okay. And the good thing is they're actually very, very happy to do what they do. Otherwise they, they don't have to do that anymore. And when they put out a new album, it's very similar in the musical style. They don't change their riffs or anything. And um, there's another one, <clears throat> like Bruce Springsteen. This guy is like, this is also an image. And this guy is the guy from uh, Philadelphia, the next door kind of guy. He could work at any diner. He could be a truck driver. You know, he's somebody that any, um, the, the typical American, anybody can relate to say, oh yeah, he's real. And he means what he says. And you can tell by the way he's standing and he's looking, this is always real. And um, that's why people love Bruce Springsteen. I mean, of course, he can sing and he can play guitar and he's written some good songs, no doubt about it. But it's because he's so authentic. That's why people really adore him. And that's why I know people who've been to 25 concerts of Bruce Springsteen say, no, that doesn't get boring because the guy's real. <laughs> it's not a show. It's not repeating a show. He's just, he's like he's, seeing a friend. It's, yeah, exactly. And it, it's, and, and that's, that's, what people want to connect with. And um, yeah, so um, I don't know, is there anything we can learn from that? If, if you are a young struggling artist out there <clears throat> producing new music at home in times of Corona and um, sitting there with your laptop and, and, and uh, you know, uh, producing tracks and doing something and say, what do I do with them? How do I put them out? But just put them on my, I don't know, uh, put them on a website somewhere and make sure they're on Spotify. How do people discover the music? Do people just want to discover the music or do they need the story behind it? That's... Yeah. Um, if you don't have anything to, to tell, don't have a story, then um, you're just producing music and putting it out there. And there's and people just left completely in the dark about you and your image. It's going to be very, very hard for them to really pick up on you because people need those two sides. You know, they need, on the one hand, they need the music, but they want to know what to feel with it. And um, that's why they need maybe a visual something to connect them to something and give them the feeling, oh yeah, and now I know what they mean. Uh, or, or like Claude said, when the, if artists can't really say who they are, but they can tell you what they've been listening to and who they're trying to be <laughs> or who they're trying to copy or what their influences are, if you put it in a nicer way. And, um, and if I discover record covers from a band I don't know, and it's a whole, this somehow reminds me of something that I know and like, I'll give it a listen and say, yeah, I wasn't wrong. I, I can see, I can connect to the music much more easily when I see when I get the feeling, I know where these guys are coming from. I know what their, what their musical heritage is. And um, that's, I don't know, nowadays, of course, if you, there's algorithms in, in Spotify that don't check on the artist's record covers. They just check, is their music similar? So say, if you like to listen to Kings of Convenience, then maybe you'll enjoy Simon and Garfunkel because it's similar in the music not necessarily in the artwork, I don't know. Um, 
but so um, the algorithms see or they can decide what other people listen to that listen to uh, kings of convenience and say well if 80 percent who listen to that also listen to that then everybody else seems to like that but um that doesn't help you actually if you're uh, an up-and-coming artist you have to think about how do you want to be, be put out there in the world if you don't really care too much about um being recognized for your deep lyrics and so on and 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 uh, being this thoughtful person and with deep, you know, content, then maybe it's okay to go and say, well, uh, I'll put on a mask and I don't know, wear crazy clothes and be Lady Gaga or something. And then uh, you have a good chance just by, by selling an image and the music is just, you know, an add-on, but that's something you have to think about. I think that's all I wanted to say for now. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, that was great. Also very visual. Um, I'd like to take questions if we have any from the audience. Um, we can also switch your video or sound on if you'd like that. Um, tell us in the chat. Now we can just hang out a bit um, as long as our speakers have time, of course. Um, yeah, but uh, I think that rounded up uh, was what Claude was also talking about from another angle. Uh, I, I imagined we would talk more about sonic branding in general, but thank you for adapting. <laughs> that was a good. Um, I mean, if anybody's interested, if anybody's interested in sonic branding, yeah, they can contact me anytime. If uh, there's any people who need special certain sounds created for their brands, mm -hmm. but. If, uh, no, I mean, if, if, if we're talking to a lot of musicians out there, um, then uh, you guys create great music yourself. You can s try and sell. Also, you can, if you want to make money, sell music to brands. That was also a topic I could have talked about today, how artists sell themselves to brands or sell their music this, to brands. Is this realistic as um, a possible alternative um, way to make money for struggling artists at the moment? Or... Um, does it more does it involve more connections and what do you say is it is, is it realistic that someone who needs an alternative source of income to get into this <laughs> I think that might be the, the problematic part well you know um, yes, I'm sharing another screen here this is just um, these are some artists that are fairly well known and they're all from Universal and um, they're all um, up for grabs these are up for sale. Universal is, you know, going around and telling people from brands and going to a, a, a advertising agencies and saying, yeah, you can have any one of those guys. They will produce music for you just as you wish. If you tell them what you need, they'll do it. I was surprised to see people like, you know, Jack White and some of the season advertising, <clears throat> and, but they're all open for that. So um, there's already you know, big names out there who sell themselves. If you're unknown, um, then you, could, you don't have a name to sell to a brand. You don't have, any, oh, that's also, uh, if you have an image, you can sell an image uh, to a brand and the brand says, oh yeah, we are just, we want to be crazy, like, I don't know, colorful and like Lady Gaga and let's see if we can get her and we'll attract this kind of audience. <clears throat> and, um, but if you're not known, you won't be able to sell any music directly to any big brands out there. So um, you, you can produce music without telling anybody who you are and you can produce music on a brief. If somebody says, we wanna, we wanna be a brand uh, like um, that and be connected with music of Billie Eilish, and you can say, okay, I'll produce a track for you that sounds like Billie Eilish. Mm -hmm. That's how you can make music. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we have a question from James. James, would you like to unmute yourself? Are you there? Hey, yeah, sure. Um, first, of of well, nice. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, uh, thank you so much, uh, Alexander. It was a really fascinating um, uh, overview and insight into this this topic and it's uh yeah as someone who's also uh making music and probably in that camp of 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 you know solo artists at home developing an image so to speak 
Uh, I found it very insightful. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more. I was curious about this sort of image of authenticity as I feel like the niche that I'm in, there are these niches such as in electronic music where, uh, often, where the image or brand of the musician is not usually supposed to be uplifted over the content itself. It's, you know, like DJs in the older, older days were often hidden from the dance floor at certain clubs, et cetera. And there's this sort of um, mythology in certain niches that there's like a cultural bias against marketing oneself or shopping an image. It's, it's not very, very uh, punk or electronic to, to uh, put forth an image or to be seen as self-promoting an image. And there's authenticity as a high value uh, from my perspective in that scene. And yet there's still sort of this, uh, there's still then a, it becomes its own uh, scene it's, uh, to, to market oneself as authentic. Uh, everyone knows that everyone's doing it. It's kind of a, a snake eating its tail. And I feel like it also becomes something that um, over time, there's kind of like the authenticity wars. I'm more authentic than you. How can I show my most authentic self by, you know, uh, I, I know people who are, you know, venting emotionally on, on Instagram because that's part of their authenticity, right? Um, so I wanted to know if you had any, any thoughts on that, how to, uh, in these in these niches where you don't have a marketing team, you're probably a social artist, uh, uh, probably a solo artist, um, and there's this whole, you know, circular dilemma of authenticity. Uh, how how does one approach uh, creating an image when that's sort of um, uh, what's the word um, passe, so to speak? Yeah, I mean that, that that's a really interesting point because there are there's always codes. There's certain codes that people can identify from you as being authentic or not. So people will check and. Uh, does this guy know, does he belong to our scene? Does he belong to the kind of uh, music that I like to listen to? And it, it does, does that fit in? Is, that, is he real, is he authentic? Does he know what he's talking about? That means, does he know the codes? And uh, so you may know the codes of uh, the scene you're in, but um, that's also something that Claude again, I think uh, said, you need to disrupt somewhere. If you wanna like stand out and say, okay, I can respect a lot of these codes and, and, and be authentic in a way, and but you have to like find some aspect where you differentiate and where you stand out. If you want, if you're looking for the big commercials or big commercial success, but if you're looking for for taking a bigger step somewhere, I mean, there's always exceptions. If you're just like so fantastic as an artist and you're respected by your uh, peer group, then things might work just like that and you can just stay as authentic as you are and just don't go crazy and don't do anything and just say hey no I want to convince everybody with the quality of my music but just doing that is sometimes not that easy unfortunately <clears throat> thank you <laughs> I think we just posted something in the chat regarding tickets am I right yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, if you want to join our conference on the fourth, um, you have you can get a fifty percent discount on tickets by um, following the link and using the code that was just pasted in the chat. Um, yeah. If we have more questions, we can keep talking. If not, we can wrap it up. How is everyone doing? Do we have more questions? Can you open the chat, please? All right. I thank you all for being here. Um, and I hope to see you at Most Wanted Music. <laughs>